Divine Truth Assistance Group. These group assistance sessions are about putting principles of divine truth into action. This discussion is part of the 2014 Australia Group 2 series. The topic is Understanding Self. Jesus discusses Deconstructing the Facade Self. Filmed on the 30th of July 2014 in Monterey, New South Wales, Australia. This is part one. All right, uh, a little bit late start. Um, just had to talk to a few people this morning, so we've done that. How are we doing? Yeah? You felt a bit more positive after yesterday? Yeah? That's good. Um, why does it take somebody to encourage you before you feel more positive? Isn't that an interesting question? Can you see that's an addiction in itself? Needing somebody else to cheer you up, make you, make you feel like everything's worthwhile? Yeah. See, when I, when, I feel, uh, when I feel down or restricted or fearful or any of those things, I don't come running to you to have you cheer me up. <laughs> right? So sooner or later, you're going to have to be very self-sufficient with regard to that, you see? Self-sufficient, dependent on yourself and God in order to um, like work through what you feel emotionally. I just keep reminding myself, God's, God's wonderful. If I'm feeling bad, it's got nothing to do with God. It's got everything to do with me. <laughs> right. Everything God does is so wonderful. Okay. So are we ready for today? It's hard day today. Bring it on. Yeah, that's the way. That's really good. So we're going to get stuck straight into the program this morning and uh, we may get to do a few feedback sessions today, we'll see how we go, but we really want to focus on making sure that we give you this information today firstly before we do anything else. So my first, first talk will be by myself, deconstructing the facade self. Mary will come after myself and she will talk to you about allowing yourself to experience the hurt self. So that's the subject of a matter today. It was going to be addictions, remember, but we've now put those on to tomorrow. So tomorrow will be the addictions day. Okay, um, what the last group found was that this was the most difficult talk for them to understand. Okay, so um, you may find the same. My suggestion to you is to ask questions, engage, and any questions that you do have to help you understand, I'm happy to engage. But uh, we need to understand that all of the processes regarding self are all emotional. So it doesn't matter how much intellectual knowledge you gather here, you will not feel, feel the truth of this knowledge we're trying to impart to you today without you going through some personal experiences. That's the way it will be. Everyone can get that? Okay. Well, let's get started. What is the facade self? You learned about it yesterday, so you should be able to tell me now. If we come down to Linda, and then we'll go back to uh, Lorleen. Hi, Linda. Uh, it's the self that we create in order to avoid feeling our hurt self. No. No? No. Who created it? We did. No. Who created it? Others. Yes. Okay. Okay. Right, this is one of the first misconceptions the other group had too. We we're always saying we. We assisted its development. We, didn't, we weren't the first persons who created it. If you were in your natural, real self and you were allowed to actually be yourself all the way through your growing up years, you would never have created a facade. Right? So the reality is you didn't create it. You, your environment created it and you assisted its development. Does that make sense? Yep, good. Lovely. Uh, I don't have a lot to add on to that, um, but uh, um, I feel it was um, that 
the greater the facade is, the greater I want to avoid all the, um, the pain that I don't want to face. So I'm um, just, you know, just not wanting to face any of it. So the bigger I create it is, is what I feel the bigger I have been hurt or, or feel, you know. Like yep, so I feel you're getting a bit complicated, but yes, um, obviously the more facade you create, obviously there's, you create more to cover over certain things that you feel are insufficient within you. Yeah, and that's what I understand is how many facades I have. Yes. Was it a bit of a shock to learn that you've got lots? Not really when you analyse your life though, right? Because you know when you deal with family, you deal with friends, you deal with your girlfriend, you deal with your boyfriend, you deal with your husband, wife, like everybody you seem to be different with you know, oftentimes. So obviously there's a bit of a facade, facade there so you can see and measure that. Yeah, that's good. If we come forward to Camilla. Camilla. Um, it's the one in me. Just a bit closer with the mic. Uh, it's, it's the one in me who don't want to feel pain. Yes, yes. So it's a part of you that doesn't want to feel the pain. Yep, yep. It's good. If we go out the back to Gary. Hi, Gary. Um, it's it's what how we start to behave to to please our parents and to. Um, modify our, 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 ourselves to, to fit into what our parents wanted us to be. Yes, and, and to be frank, that's not a conscious choice at the beginning. That's their choice. They want you to do that. So, so this is why the facade self is not created by you. It's created by your environment first, and then it's developed by you in order to continue getting the approval, acceptance, and other feelings that you feel once you create this facade. Yep. Yep. Good eh? We come across. It's where my addictions are, where I... um, it is where a lot of them are, but not necessarily all of them. Because yes. I've seen children of two years of age have a lot of addictions. Right. Yeah. You like for example, when you as a parent give the child everything at once without restriction, by the time it's two it thinks that it could demand anything at once. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That means it has an addiction, yeah. right? a compulsion to demand whatever it wants. Now, so, so some of your addictions were developed within you and for, for many of you ladies who have been oppressive towards men and, and other people, is that it, it's been developed in you some of these addictions from the age of one or two. So, so you can't say that all of your addictions are related to facade, but a lot of them are. A lot of them are. Yep. If we can come to Gwen. Um, the biggest thing I got was it's my insensitive self. Yes. Because I want to become more ins more sensitive. So. Yes. Do you remember the emotion? Uh, do you remember yesterday when we went through the real self, the hurt self, and the facade self? The second section of each one of those things that we went through, we discussed with you the feelings involved with that self. You remember that? My suggestion to you is when you get home is to really have a good look at those feelings because those feelings will help you identify how much you're actually in one part of yourself compared to the others. Everyone got that from yesterday? Re very important thing to, to do for yourself. If you can do that, you'll be able to identify for yourself. Remember, this is all about teaching you how to do these things for yourself. So you'll be able to identify for yourself when you're in a facade. You'll feel the feeling, you know, there it goes again. There it is again, you know, my facade popping up there. And, it, and at least you have some, then, some kind of intellectual awareness that it exists. Yep. Okay, well let's go through some of these reminders. My facade self is created in childhood by other people not wanting me to be my real self. Right? So, so my, a lot of you have been going, oh, my facade self is created by myself. Well, you know, your facade self started when you were just a little baby. You had, had no cognizant, cognizant development, you know, no intellectual development. How could you say it's created by you? Like, it's created by other people forcing their facade or forcing what they wanted you to be onto you. 
It's been further developed by my purposeful desire to ignore my real and hurt selves. So that's all true. It's very adult in nature because the adults or myself as a maturing adult created facades. So that's why it's very adult-like in its nature. So even in a two-year-old, sometimes you see some very adult-like emotions because already mum and dad have imposed that kind of a thing upon them. And we could call it the adult facade just to help you connect with the emotions associated. Marco, and then... Glenn. Is it based on just one parent or both parents? creating this facade? It's not only based on parents, it's no, based on okay. the parents, primarily of course, but it's based on, you know, if you went to kindergarten, you went to daycare, you went to school, you know, all of these, you know, so usually your brain is only fully developed, what, around seven years of age or so, that's what most people realise now. So all the time before then, you've done heaps of things, you've spent time with heaps of different types of people, grandfathers, grandmothers, you know, all of them participated in the creation of the facade. Yeah. Um, how other people see me is not necessarily my facade, though, is it? It's what they project. Correct. So, but, but in our childhood, how other people saw us was very much, very much dictated our emotional response. So in other words, if, if you were born and your family saw you as someone they didn't really want, then that emotion would have entered you, and so you would have then tried to be something they wanted. Does that make sense? So it's, it's an automatic response in order to try to get something from the situation that we hadn't got before. Yeah. But as an adult, I don't have to live up to what people want to see me as. No, not at all. Of course. Yeah. Why would you ask such a question? You know the answer to that. I was just seeing in conversation with my sister, I was talking about emotions and yep. she said, you know, let me describe how I see my sister, you know, you're happy, you've got friends, you've got this and you've got that and I just thought, that's a mask, you're not seeing through that and I thought, well, that doesn't have to be me. No, but see, a lot of the times when people describe what they observe, they're actually telling you some very important things about yourself uh, and in the, they're telling you the mask you put on and that's what you'll portray to the world. So this is the thing that's quite funny, I find, is that many of us as, as adults want other people to understand us. But at the same time, we're putting out a facade. How can we expect them to understand us? Like our expectations that somebody understands and looks through the facade is a demand in itself that's unloving. If, if we were truthful, honest, direct, outspoken, candid, you know, and all those things that were part of our real self, and then no one understood us, then I can understand you being maybe a little bit upset. But, but if you're putting on a facade most of your life, and, and then other people don't, don't understand you, and then you get upset, I think, well, you deserve to be treated that way because that's the facade you wanted them to understand about you. You know what I mean? We, we have these really confusing things that we do to other people with this facade thing. Well, on one hand, we want to put out the facade. On the other hand, we want them to understand our real self. <laughs> As if that's ever going to happen while we're putting out a facade. Never going to happen. So you've got to be careful about these kind of an analyses, if you like, as adults, of what you expect from people, what's loving, what they should do, and all those kind of things, when you actually have contributed quite heavily to their misunderstanding of you. Does that make sense? And, and if you think about it, others are the same. They contribute quite heavily to your misunderstanding of them. And we've got to see that it's all because all of us live in these facades all the time, and so of course we're going to all misunderstand everybody. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Okay, we go to Lorraine. Um, Lorraine, can I say that um, uh, spirits, a spirit influence um, influences my facade? Well, it's where most of your spirit influence occurs. However, most of your spirit influence occurs because you don't want to feel your hurt. 
And so the facade causes you to create a facade, which then, of course, spirits can easily manipulate in order. And all they do is they manipulate your avoidance of your hurt. So that's all they're doing. So if I'm in a, a spirit world sleep state, I also can be in facade, right? Totally, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In fact, many of you are less in a facade in your sleep state than you are in your awake state. And you know why? Thanks, Anto. Anto, because we feel we can get away with it. And yeah. We can, it's self-fulfilling. You can just do what you want. And also because most people who observe us in our sleep state can see what we're really like. Whereas most people who observe us in our wake state can't see what we really like. And so the facade has a benefit in our awake state. But in our sleep state, more people can see what we really like, so we have less facade. That's normally the case. Yep. Good day. Remember the emotions of the facade self. This is something that I'd like to reconnect you with this morning. What were some of those emotions? You remember them? Thanks, Jane. Jane, um, one of them was anger. Yep. And yeah, I'll just say What is that. anger? But remember, anger can also belong to the hurt, can't the it? The hurt self as well. So yes. it's sort of got two. But, but can you see there's going to be a different type of flavour with the anger? The hurt self is very much childlike in its nature. So therefore, the hurt child's anger is going to feel very childlike. Whereas the adult, the facade is very much adult like in its nature. So the adult's anger is going to be very adult like. It's going to be like blaming other people. You know, the child, when it feels anger, it just feels anger. It doesn't blame anybody. It, doesn't, it just uh, lays on the floor, has a great big tantrum, and it doesn't care about what anybody thinks about it, but it also doesn't project all of that rage everywhere, right? Generally, it just feels it for itself. That's what a child does. But an adult, you get an adult angry, what do they do? They blame you. They, you know, it's all your fault. They minimise what they've done. They do all of these different things. Well, that's the adult anger. And the adult anger, yes, is a part, big part of the facade. Okay. So it loves these things. It loves addiction, compulsion, resistance, cruelty, nastiness, meanness, arrogance, superiority, all those things. Why does it love those things? Because all those things cover over hurt. Uh, so it's always trying to cover over hurt. Right? It's insensitive, unaware, pretending, false, closed, controlled, untrusting. You know, it's all those things. It's dishonest, untruthful, insincere, invasive, unemotional generally, illogical most of the time. It's just doing what the addictions demand, which is very illogical. It's immovable, imprudent, thoughtless, irrational, reckless, irresponsible. Uh, these are all parts of our adult facade. The irony is, is that most of you think your adult facade is logical, rational, and at the same time, thoughtful, <laughs> careful, right? That's not what I observe. I see you going around like a wrecking ball most of the time and having no idea why, <laughs> right? And this is the problem with our adult facade. It has very little idea about itself, right? It's just addicted to the facade. So my facade self is the main cause of my choice towards unloving actions. Now I've introduced the term sinful here. I have purposefully done so because many of you have not got something that I've been trying to teach you for many, many years. And that is this. Anything that is unloving whether it's a thought, word or a deed, shall we call them, an action, anything that's unloving is sin. Now when I say to you unloving behaviour, which is a term I use very, very frequently actually, you don't think of it as a sin. You just go, oh, it's just some unloving behaviour. 
And you don't think of it as, what does the word sin connotate, if I use the word sin to you? We go to Daniel. Yeah, Maxwell, Daniel, one of the two. <laughs> Uh, has it got something to do with going against God? It has, yes. So it's about, it's about something that's not only against man or against someone else, but also it's actually unloving in terms of something that goes against God's laws, shall we say? Mm -hmm. So against God's laws. Every time we sin, actually, we're demonstrating to God that we don't care about God, actually that we don't care about God's laws. We're demonstrating that we, we really think we should be able to get away with things all the time. We're demonstrating all of these things. We should be able to get away with being unloving. We actually have quite an arrogant viewpoint, most of us, about sin, because we, we just say, oh, I've just been unloving. Nothing major. From God's perspective, it is the most major thing you could do, is to be unloving. Mistakes of knowledge, Puh, nothing to God. You're allowed to know nothing. <laughs> and God will still love you. And God will still be fine with you. God will still give you love. But if you are unloving, now there's a different, it's different from God's perspective. And most of us don't see it that way. Most of us think, oh, I'm just unloving occasionally. You know, I know my addictions are unloving, but I really want them. <laughs> you know, we have a laugh about that. And... Do you see what? You can see automatically we're not seeing the seriousness of our own behaviour. Yeah? This is why God created the feedback system of pain and suffering. Because most of us are completely ignorant of a loving behaviour unless we get some feedback of pain and suffering and then we start going, oh, maybe I should change. In other words, we're even quite selfish about change. We're only changing because we feel pain. We don't care most of the time how much pain other, we've caused other people. We only seem to care about how much pain they caused us or, or we've caused ourselves. We don't care what we've done to other people generally. And this is a problem because what we do to other people is uh, some of the largest things, the largest sins we can engage. Okay, anything else? I'll come down to Rita and then back to Catherine. Um, a sin, it damages my soul and it causes me pain. Good. So and it has to be forgiven and repented. So, yes. So let's, let's look at this one thing at a time, though, shall we? So the sin damages my soul. And then I go more in my facade because I don't want to feel more pain. That's true. But what, what, whose, other, whose soul does it also damage? Others. Others. Like, like to be honest with you, I'm more okay with you choosing to damage yourself than I am okay with you choosing to damage someone else. Can you see why? Because I increase their suffering and then they go down that track. Yeah, and, they, and it started. wasn't their choice. See, see, when you damage someone else, there's two problems now. One problem is, is that you're not honouring free will. You're not honouring their will to make their own choice. If they want to damage themselves, let them do it. <laughs> Don't you be the person who does it to them because now what you've done is taken away their choice and damaged them. Right? So you've actually, every time you damage someone else, you're, you're doing two things wrong, not one. You, whatever the thing is that you're doing wrong to damage them is one, and then the fact that you've taken away their free will in the process is two. Every time you do that, you damage yourself twice. So, so when you damage somebody else, somebody else, you damage them, firstly, and then you damage yourself twice. Right? Not just the same, or you damage yourself twice, because you're breaking more than one law at the time when you're damaging them. Now, if you only damage you, then that's your free will. You're not damaging your free will, so therefore you're not damaging that part of, any, of your own soul. You're just doing what you want, damaging yourself. You've only damaged yourself once. So whenever you damage yourself, it's only once. Whenever you damage somebody else, it's twice every time you do it. Right? Most people are not aware of that, right? 
How many of you were aware that that's what's actually going on every time you damage someone else? Yeah. It's something to consider, isn't it? Yep. So, yes, damage others. So this was damage to the other people's soul. If you damage others, you're doing it twice, two sins in a row. Um, hi, Laura. Thanks, Laura. Um, so if you don't, if you see someone else damaging um, another person mm -hmm. and you don't stop it, mm -hmm. do you also, is that a damage for you as well? Yes, but you're damaging yourself once because you're not impacting upon the other person's free will. You're only impacting upon your own. You do damage yourself by not acting. So sins of omission are just as serious to God as sins of commission. So do you know, know the difference? An omission is where you didn't do something that you should have done or if you loved you would have done. And a sin of commission is where you did something purposefully out of harmony with love. And both are sins from God's perspective. And in fact, the spirit world in the first sphere is littered with people who have committed a whole series of sins of omission. Did you know that? There are so many people in the spirit world in the first sphere, in the hills, that are only there because they chose to not do something. Whoa. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. Does that now make you less worried about mistakes? <laughs> no? <laughs> well, yeah. We all get stressed out when we hear all these things, right? <laughs> it makes sense, though, if you think about it, doesn't it? If you know what to do, and you don't do it, if you know what's loving and you choose to purposely not do it, then, then it is a sin because you already knew what was loving. You should have done it. See? Okay. Anything else, Lorley? Um, trying to avoid sinning and being unloving, mm -hmm. um, I create then a facade? No, no. <laughs> see, see, if you listen to Mary's talk on day one, there was a difference between willpower and will, isn't there not? And when you try to avoid sin, you are automatically being unloving because you're actually using your willpower and your willpower is about avoiding your own real condition. The only real way to avoid sin is to change your condition, yep. which means changing your soul, using your will to change your soul. Yeah, and that, that's what I mean. If I'm trying, because I think, oh, that's unloving, but I don't really, you know, really know, but I just think, okay, I'm not going to do that because it's unloving, but I, by doing that, I create a facade. Of course you're going to. You're using your willpower to avoid yeah. your real condition. Yeah, so therefore it, it becomes a sin. Of course it's a sin, yeah. yeah. Of course. Many of you still having a struggle between will and willpower, notice that? Still having a struggle like, and, and still struggling to see that every time you try, you're, you're trying to overcome your soul, and your soul, and you're overcoming, trying to overcome your soul, soul's will. To change, remember the subject of the first day was all about changing, to change, you must recognize your real soul condition. Right? And that, you can't do that if you're trying to skip over it. You can't do that. And so trying to skip over your real soul condition is a sin in itself because it's unloving behavior towards yourself. Right? Julie? So in certain circumstances, I'm just, this is a question. <laughs> sure, sure, fine. Right. Um, okay, if you know that eating meat is damaging your soul, mm -hmm. so you give up eating meat mm -hmm. just so that you respect the, the life of the animal, but mm -hmm. in your soul still, mm -hmm. you haven't got the utter truth of that, mm -hmm. but you know, no, I'm not going to eat meat, mm -hmm. um, so you can use your willpower, which is intellectual still, mm -hmm. and it's 
hasn't gone down to the will. So that's a good willpower. How is willpower any time good? I don't understand why you think this way. Like, let's look at let's look at this question. You're saying he is hundred percent perfect with regard to love when it comes to eating meat, which is having a feeling inside of me yeah. that I don't want to kill animals and I don't want other people to kill animals and I don't want to harm my body by eating killed animals and all these kind of things. These are all feelings. So that's and a hundred percent feeling person who feels everything about that and has resolved all of those things about that and also has resolved the feeling that says I need my mummy's approval by eating meat. My mummy is going to disapprove of me eating meat. So I would have also had to resolve that feeling. Do you understand? Because yeah. that's one of the driving forces of why half of us ate meat in the first place because mummy and daddy wanted us to. Or when mummy and daddy didn't feel it, felt that if we just had a vegetarian or a vegetable diet that, that we wouldn't be able to survive. So that's all about their belief systems. We'd have to have released all of them too, right? That's 100% a feeling person would have got to that place with regard to eating meat. Let's say we're eating meat right here. We're, we're actually eating meat at the moment. Right? So we're not very loving about on this issue. We're not loving to God because it's against God's laws. We're not loving to our own soul. It damages the souls of others because I'm asking them to slaughter my meat for me in most cases. So therefore I'm, I'm participating in the damage of the soul of others. Right? So, and a lot of them are unaware of that, but I'm actually doubling up my sin by asking them to do it. So you'd be better off killing it yourself. Yeah. That's, a, that's a better condition of love than you would be asking other people to kill it for you. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? But what we need to be careful of is this. This place here is loving. Every other place on this sliding scale is unloving. Okay. Every other place. Okay. So 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 me eating meat, yeah. if I'm eating meat, that's unloving. If I stop eating meat, but I only do it using my willpower, that's unloving. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. Using willpower. If I stop eating meat using my will in one direction because I don't want to harm animals, I realise that I'm harming animals and I actually have a soul-based recognition that I'm harming animals and that's the reason why I stopped eating meat, that's still unloving. Really? Yeah. Because I'm not realising I'm harming a lot more than animals. Oh yeah. I'm okay. harming myself, I'm yes. harming other people's yeah. soul by asking them to slaughter meat for me mm. and I haven't gone through any of those emotions. Mm. So I'm still unloving. Mm. Right? <laughs> so, let, so let's look at all of this. These are degrees of unlovingness that are improving, are they not? Yes. Right? But they're still unloving. And what's the definition of sin? Any unloving thought, word or deed. So if you've stopped eating animals because you knew you were harming animals but you've had no other emotional realizations about eating of meat then you're still being unloving because you didn't you still haven't realized all the things that were involved when you ate meat do, do you understand yeah i do yeah. yeah so so you're asking me what are the degrees of unloving sure there are degrees of unloving it's like yesterday when ella asked a question about you know is she harming her child by not loving him yes but but if if she murdered him that would even be worse right mm -hmm. obviously there's degrees of unlovingness but it's all unloving and therefore it's all yeah sin sin and you don't see it that way you know what you know what you often want from me you want me to say but i've stopped eating me and i go yes so you still have the viewpoint in you that you weren't harming any other person on the planet when you ate it. No. So, so the reality is I still feel that emotion in you that, that's still there, which is I was innocent of harming anybody when I ate meat. And that's not true. Yeah. You've harmed the environment. Yes. You've harmed heaps of other animals, not just the animals you killed. You know, if you think about it, we've not only harmed the animals we killed, we also harmed every animal that we had to destroy the environment of in order to, to grow the animals that we killed. Yeah. And hardly any of us have given that any thought. 
right? So this is still indicating that there's unloving emotions within us, right? And therefore there are still thoughts, words and deeds that we've taken that are out of harmony with love on that subject, even though we've stopped eating meat. And the problem for many of us is we go, I've stopped eating meat, I'm much more loving. Okay, well, hang on a sec. You can stop eating meat and still have all of these emotions in you. That doesn't prove anything. It just proves that you're less unloving, right? In other words, you're a little bit more loving than you were last time. That's all it proves. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's still sin, and it's going to remain sin until this happens. Until we have dealt with all of those emotions and we're 100% loving, now we're not sinning. That's how it works. And you know what most of us want? Most of us want some feedback system that goes something like this. Oh, at least I've stopped doing the most unloving thing. That's like a murderer coming to me and saying, at least I've stopped murdering, give me some credit. <laughs> but he still feels like murdering and he's still angry all the time and he's still violent all the time and he still rapes people and he still does other things, but he wants some credit because he stopped murdering. And that's what most of us are like. We want some credit for the thing that we dropped, the, uh, the unloving thing, as if we've done some wonderful thing by dropping one unloving thing but still retaining all the others. So you're saying that I'm in facade then as well? Sorry? By not eating meat, I'm in facade? Of course, if you're not eating meat and you haven't started to address a lot of these things, you still have a facade about some of those things, obviously. Yes, I, obviously I do. Obviously. Yeah. Yep. So the key is to recognise that and go, OK, while I have stopped an unloving action, which is a very good thing, so I'm not saying stopping an unloving action is bad, I'm saying stopping something that's unloving, stopping a serious sin, and meeting meat is not a serious sin compared to many of the other sins you engage, right, on a daily basis. I know. But, but we stop eating meat, right, and, uh, and so we've stopped a sin that's quite, quite serious, has a detrimental effect to other people, the planet, lots of other things that, uh, that we're now contributing something more beneficially towards. But that doesn't mean that we've resolved this issue. And you've got to stop thinking you've resolved the issue just by changing the behaviour, because you haven't. You haven't. You need to go through some feelings in order to really stop the issue in your soul. Does everyone get that? Yeah? Have you not considered that before? That it was all like degrees of unlovingness? Isn't that interesting how we, we often ignore all of these degrees of unlovingness and, and we want somebody to just say to us, but I'm being more loving, you know, give me some credit. Right. So all the deforestation and everything around as well, so we still have to feel for all, all of that that's gone on yeah, for wh Why do you think I have... I have going on in my property all of these environmental recovery recovery processes. Why do you think I, I spend a lot of my time invested in that? I, I even have one person who helps me with that, Brendan. He's pretty much helping all the time he works with me. He's pretty much helping me with that. Why do you think I do that? Because because I feel that I need to correct the damage that I've done. So you're still in the in the process of 100% loving? Or you've well, gone there, you're already once there. Once you deal with all these feelings, you will be, per you'll be motivated to do everything you can to fix up the damage you've done to the environment, yeah. personally. And you won't blame other people yeah. for that. You'll do it yourself. You'll do everything you can. Right? That's what happens when you no longer want to sin and you want to be loving all the time. You do everything you can to fix up the problem. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what, that's why I'm involved in doing that every day. Every day is part of my task, every day. I ate heaps of meat when I was younger, five times a day. Yeah. Mm. Brendan? Brendan, just a little bit lost on, on what I think is my arrogance and the sins of omission. Yep. I. I know I have a facade and don't um, speak up when I would like to, um, or not like to, actually. <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> You're afraid to, yeah. But 
arrogance comes into it as well, and I'm just wondering where arrogance... Well, arrogance comes into it in the sense that we don't want to go through the emotion that if we you know, did what we were afraid of, we would have to go through. So, so this is where arrogance starts coming into our life, is that we, we don't want to go through specific emotions, and so what we do is we avoid the situation. Right? And this is what, what, what are one, is one of the sins of omission, you know, reasons for the sins of omission. It's because we just don't want to feel what it's going to feel like when we stick our nose into there, and into the place where we should put our nose, and then get it cut off by somebody. <laughs> we don't want to feel what that's going to feel like. Right. So it's just a matter of saying it in a loving way. It is. Once you're loving, you will do that automatically, of course. Yep. But let's talk, uh, give a bit of an example about sins of omission here. In this example, we're about eating meat, shall we? When we ate meat, right, we were involved in a sin of commission. We were purposefully choosing to do something, right? We didn't know it at the time, so there was some ignorance involved. But it was still a sin of commission. It was a personal choice that we've made because we wanted to eat something. When we became more aware and we stopped eating meat using our willpower, we we're at least at that st stage saying, I'm no longer going to be involved in this sin of commission, which is a better place, isn't it? So we're no longer involved in the sin of commission. However, we're still now involved in sins of omission about the eating of animals because we're unaware that we've damaged other people doing it. We're unaware at that place generally that we've damaged the environment doing it and we're, we're not engaged in fixing up any of those things. In other words, we're just blaming now everybody else. This is what often smokers do, right? <laughs> when they give up smoking, they then blame everybody else for smoking, not aware that they did it for 20 years, <laughs> and there must be some results in the, in the environment for that. So this is what we're doing here. We're, we're, we're still involved in sins of omission. In other words, we're not engaged in correcting what we did, right? and that's a sin of omission. Do you see the difference? So here we were involved in a sin of commission, however ignorant we were. Here we learnt to become more aware, so we dropped the ignorance, and then we engaged in something using our willpower, so now we're no longer engaged in the sin of commission, but we're still engaged in a lot of omission sins. We're not correcting what we did, how long we did it for, we're not trying to correct the damage we did to the environment, we're not, trying to, we're not seeing that there was people involved. You know, there was people involved in our choice to eat meat. People, slaughterhouses, you know, have you ever been in a slaughterhouse? Walk into one, you know, have you ever watched the, what is it, the movie Earthlings, you know? Go into them and have a look at what happens. There's a great movie you could watch just to go into them and look at what happened. You were involved in those sins because you were involved because you wanted the meat. Right? Then feel about that, your personal involvement in that. Now we're starting to deal with some of the sins of omission. In other words, we're releasing from ourselves the sins of omission. And eventually we'll get to the point where all the time we're loving and now we're in a place where we're always trying to correct what we've done in the past. We're always trying to, and it's not trying to anymore, because we've released all of the emotions that cause us to have to try. And now we're actually, our will is engaged in doing it. We want to. It's automatic. It's no longer trying. Right? And so I think that's a good illustration of what it means between the sins of commission and the sins of omission. Just with that one thing, eating meat. So while it's great that we've given up eating meat and become vegan or whatever, that doesn't mean much from a soul perspective unless we've been engaged in removing from our heart, our soul, all the other things that were involved in that sin. And if we really loved, we would do that. Does that make sense, Brendan? Like, can you see? You can see that the only reason why we wouldn't do that is because we don't want to feel some things. We don't want to feel that we were involved in knocking down half the Amazon. Uh, we don't want to feel that. We want to blame everybody else for that. <laughs> All the people who are still eating meat, they're the blame for that. You know, we want. This is a trouble. We don't want to really feel everything that's involved. You want to ask another question? 
Okay, grab the mic. <laughs> it just gives a lot more clarity on, on you know, for, for about six weeks I lost a lot of interest in what I was doing yeah. at the place. And um, you know, I was off for four weeks or so and, and uh, came back with a bit of a vengeance. And, yeah. um, and it was exciting, um, just perhaps understanding what you'd been doing. Exactly. See, we've never even had this discussion, have we? No. Even no. you didn't know my motivations. So the passion is bubbling. Yeah. Um, and, and, the, and on my property now, you are getting paid mm. <laughs> to help me undo the things we've both done eating meat. Yep. Yeah. So, the, yeah, a lot more understanding of where I'm at and what I can do. Yeah. Uh, and reasons why. Yep. But, yep. Thanks. Yep. That's good. Okay, if we come down to Ella and across to Jada. Jada. So Ella here first. So basically <clears throat> someone who goes vegan without hanging on all the way yeah. and starts uh, sort of being an activist and arrogant and angry and uh, pushing all this information on others yes. is sinning more than yes. if he was just quietly eating his meat. Yes. Why? Because he's now pushing it all on other people, which is a breaking their free will. Every time you break another person's free will, you're committing two acts, not one. So, of course, he's become worse. So he stopped eating meat, so, but he's done it for the wrong reasons and he hasn't dealt with all of his omissions. Right? And then he's on top of that, using that as a, as a mechanism to harm other people, to get angry with other people. And getting angry with people is worse than killing an animal. Shall I say that again? Getting angry with a person is worse than killing an animal from God's perspective. Have you not thought of that? No. Huh. Why is it worse? You tell me. Sandra, over here. If we can just go back straight to Sandra and then back down. Because here. it's a soul. We're harming the soul. Because it's a God's soul. child. Yeah. yeah. The animal is a creature that doesn't have a soul. Whenever you harm a person, you're harming someone with a soul. That is, that is much worse than anything you could do to an animal. Of course, it requires some similar emotions of what you might do to the animal to do it. But, but honestly, it's much worse. So, so those of you who think that, oh, I've given up eating meat, but I still get angry with my partner, everything's fine. What? You know, like, what's the worst sin from God's perspective? Every time you harm a soul, that's the worst sin. God gave you dominion over the animals. God didn't give you dominion over your partner. Did you just get what I said? God gave you dominion over the animals in that the animals don't have a soul and you do. Therefore, you are responsible for what you choose to do with those animals. But God never made you responsible for your partner. Huh? They are responsible. They were a free thinking, free. They're, a, they're a, what we classify as a sentient being, a person who has their own choices to make. Every time you get angry with them, you are harming their will. Every time. And you're damaging them through an emotional flow of uh, damaging emotion into their soul. That is much worse than killing an animal. So those people are running around, running around, you know, supporting all the animals while they're getting enraged with the people. Well, can you see what's happening? Yeah, see, God, hey, God makes clever systems. You can't get away with things. Uh, it's really good, I feel. Yeah. I think you just answered it then, pretty much. It was just basically um, about... So it's a sin of omission. It's not a sin of omission to speak up in those situations. If someone's... Like, I'm just thinking with my friends, if they're eat, choosing to eat meat next to me, yep. would I say something to them? Not unless they've asked you. Not unless they've asked. Okay. Why? I don't know. Just maybe they don't know. If they haven't asked you, you're forcing your opinion on a soul. Yeah. 
Okay. That's worse than killing the animal. Yeah. Okay. So you wouldn't. Can you see that? Remember, I said any interaction where you damage another soul is worse than any interaction where you damage the animal. It makes sense, doesn't it? The souls are humans, are people, those, you know, they're much more important. They're the pinnacle of God's creation. <laughs> they're much more important than the animal from God's perspective. Yeah, that, that's a bit of a shock for most of you, right? Yeah, but if you think about it logically, why has it ever been a shock? Why would it be a shock? Doesn't make any sense, does it? Uh, Nick, yes, just sir. as a continuation of that same theme, yep. uh, I, my understanding from what you were saying earlier is that it is a sin of omission if you are to see an unloving action being perpetrated by someone on someone else, say an act of violence, and for you not to speak up or to say something. Speak up? Would you speak up? It, but that's my question. Is it unloving to not say anything, not do anything, when you see say, an act of violence from one person to another. Well, let's look at the situation. Would you speak up? Would I say something? Would, would anybody, if they were loving, speak up? I, my feeling is that you would. You would say something. Doesn't it depend on the feeling you have? Yeah, if, if you weren't overcome by your fear of the reaction that it would draw. Well, you, you look at it. Most people who get involved in other people's act of violence are angry with the person perpetrating the violence, are they not? Mm -hmm. So you've got a person here who's being violent, right? You've got the person that they're perpetrating the violence towards, okay? And then you're the third party observing this. When you see that person perpetrating this violence, what's your feeling? For me, it's sadness. Sadness? Mm -hmm. What, what are you sad about? The damage that they're doing to themselves and to the other. And to the other person? Well, they're doing yeah. twice the amount of damage to the yep. other person than to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But, yep. Any other feelings you have? Um, so what would cause you now to speak up? You're saying that your sadness will cause you to speak up. For many of you, it would be your sadness or your anger that causes you to speak up, wouldn't it? But aren't, isn't sadness and anger and unloving emotion in the end, if you were completely 100% loving, though you wouldn't feel those two feelings about the situation. God doesn't feel this, those two feelings mm -hmm. about the situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't. So if you're motivated by your sadness or motivated by your anger to speak up, you're better off shutting up and working out what inside of yourself needs to be corrected before you can be actually loving. The only time you really can speak up and be completely self-aware is when you know you're loving and you know you're not motivated by sadness and you know you're not motivated by anger and so you speak up. Because you know you're just motivated by this pure desire for truth and love. love now, how many of you have been doing that? None of you, <laughs> when you speak up. When you speak up, you're motivated by a lot of things. But it certainly ain't the pure emotion of love and compassion for the situation in most cases. This is why most people respond to you badly. Because you're being unloving to them and they can feel it and so they're going to respond badly. Anyway, we're getting a bit waylaid now, aren't we? We're trying, what we're trying to do is we're trying to define sin for you. <laughs> Can you see from what we've already discussed that there are sins of omission, sins of commission? Can you also see that anything less than 100% loving is a sin? It, it damages, it's against God's laws, it damages your soul, and most of the time it damages other people's soul doubly than your own. Huh? So you can see why God feels about what God feels about it. God's feeling like, no, this is wrong. When you do these things, they're wrong. This is what God's feeling about it. You're wrong. You don't want to admit you're wrong. 
you want to have degrees of wrong. <laughs> you want to have, you know, you want to, you want to be acknowledged for the improvements you've made. And God's going, well, hang on a sec. Like, sure, you've made an improvement, but, but at the end of the day, you're still wrong. <laughs> well, now, if we are truly sincere, we won't like that. And that's why I said in the first century, you must become perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You understand what I mean by that now? I didn't say you must aim for perfection. I didn't say you can acknowledge everything you get partially right and that's all fine. I said you must become, must become, must become perfect. Must. If you want a relationship with God, you're going to have to become perfect on every situation God's perfect on. Interesting, hey? Can you see why no one over 2,000 year period on earth has really done much of it? Yeah. Because it involves a very sincere, passionate desire on your part to work through these issues. Yep. Now God's got a lot of assistance for you to get through there. But it requires your engagement, these assistances. One of the things that we're going to look at is repentance and forgiveness. That's God's way of assisting you through this process. But honestly, most of us don't engage it. We don't. But the reason why I wanted to raise that issue with you is because most of you do not see your addictions as a sin. You don't see your facade as a sin. You see them as good things, <laughs> something that allows you to get your way through life. You see them as good things. And you're going to have to start seeing the sin before you're going to ever get anywhere <laughs> with regard to your facade or your addictions. You're going to have to see the imperative, the, de the depth of what's going on in order to desire change. Now, one thing that helps me a lot is like, you know, I just hate the, in, the concept myself. I just hate the concept of I'm damaging someone else. Like, honestly, I hate that. I know it's a sin. I know that every time I damage someone else, I'm doubling up the problem for them. And I know that I'm committing two things and, you know, causing a lot of damage. So do you see why I try to avoid it at all costs? Because right? I know what I'm doing when I'm doing it. See, if you knew what you were doing when you were doing it, wouldn't you also try to avoid it at all costs? And if you had to try, you would, you would firstly look at that and you'd go, wow, I'm having to try to be more loving. That's the problem. <laughs> I, 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 there's got to have something changed so that I can automatically be more loving. That would be great. And wouldn't you then focus on everything inside of you that causes you to be unloving? You, you wouldn't, you, you'd be motivated, wouldn't you? to do that. Your will would be motivated and engaged to find everything. Yeah. Do you know what? That is the first step you need to take in order to deconstruct your facade. That is the first step you need to take in order to deconstruct anything, actually. You've got to see how wrong it is and really feel it before you can ever deconstruct it. Otherwise, you're going to make excuses, you're going to make, you minimise, you justify, you blame other people. You do all sorts of things in order to avoid it. So the very first step is one of the most important steps you can take, but most of us don't even get there. You know, you think about eating meat. How, how many of you have got there where you realise how, how big the sin of it is in comparison? to what you thought. Do you see? Yep. Okay, well let's, uh, before we now go into the process of deconstructing, let's look at why it needs to be deconstructed, the facade. Well, surely the description of the facade that we gave last time would, would give you enough motivation to want to deconstruct it. <laughs> it's all those damaging parts of yourself. Wouldn't you want to get rid of it? Like, surely. Let's go some, through some of the reasons we mentioned. All of the emotions associated with the facade self will continue to dominate your life while they remain in you. Real love can't be experienced by a facade. 
You're never going to be happy while you're living in a facade because you're never going to experience love. That's not possible. Absolute truth will never be accepted by the facade. So you know all of these things of wanting to hear the truth, do the truth, be you know, be in harmony with God. Well, that's not, totally impossible while the facade, because the facade's all about lies. <laughs> it makes sense, doesn't it? Like, it's all about maintaining a lie, maintaining a fiction, maintaining an imaginary place that's all out of harmony with truth. So you can't stay in a facade and actually have a relationship with God, a relationship with love, a relationship with truth. You can't. Loving relationships are not possible for the facade. If I'm putting on a facade and Mary's putting on a facade, who are we having a relationship with? Our two facades are having a relationship. Is that a relationship? No, because relationship is based on love. And is love flowing between the two facades? No. Bartering systems, codependency is flowing between the two facades. One of us has to give up a facade for one of us to have a relationship that's any de anywhere decent. And both of us have to give up the facade if both of us want to have a relationship with each other. And it needs to be a personal choice we make rather than forced upon the other. Because as soon as I force it upon Mary, I'm now damaging her and committing another sin. So every time I try to force Mary into breaking down her facade, I'm now committing another sin. I can't do that either. The wheels of God's laws turning very tightly. You know in the pageant messages it says that really frequently, doesn't it? It says the wheels grind tightly. <laughs> you can see how they grind tightly, don't they? Every little piece of unloving behaviour or sin inside of you will need to be addressed in this process. Right? And it's wonderful because it, when you come out of that, you'll automatically be sinless. You, it, it, won't, it won't even be a struggle. It'll be easy because all the reasons for the sin has disappeared within the soul. It's fantastic. Isn't it? you, just, you don't even have to think about what you're doing. What you're doing is automatically loving every time. So you know how some of you come up and say, oh, what would I do in this situation or what would I do in that situation? Why is it that I can give you an answer about what you should do in that situation? Because it's just automatic. Once you get rid of that emotion and this emotion that caused you to not do it automatically, it becomes automatic. And particularly if you receive God's love and you work in harmony with that love and you, and, and you get clear away the sin the, or the cause of sin, because the emotions are the cause of sin, once you clear away the cause of sin, automatically do it. Imagine what it would be like. You don't have to think about any action you take. You know that every action you take is in harmony with love. You don't even have to think about it. It's just automatic every time, driven by your will, but automatic every time. Humility is not possible with the facade. Of course it's not possible. Humility is wanting to feel and experience all of your own emotions, right? Whether they're positive or negative, the facade doesn't want to do that. The facade wants to create a whole heap of positive feelings that are not part of itself and wants to ignore and, and suppress and deny all of the ones that are unloving. So the facade's not humble. All relationships of the facade are based on bartering addictions with others. The facade doesn't wish to allow the expression of our hurt self. The facade doesn't wish to allow the development of our real self. The facade cannot have a relationship with God. God does not want a relationship with your facade. <laughs> it goes both ways there. God doesn't want the relationship with your facade. So every time you offer your facade to God, God's going, I don't want that. Why would you, right? Yeah. The relationship with God has to come from your real self. Emma, down the front here. Yes. Hi, I'm Emma. Um, Just a bit closer. In. Sorry. Yes. Before hearing about this topic, I would have said, I would have thought, how can I have a facade? Because I'm. So when I'm anxious and depressed, everyone knows about it because I'm crying and yep. it's just so obvious. Um, yep. So, but you would be saying that the, 
um, that anxiety and depression is a facade itself. Yeah, it can be. And, and most often depression is, for example. Anxiety. Anxiety might be a part of the hurt self, right? So, you know, most of us in our childhood have had a lot of very, very violent things occur to us at the hands of people who say they loved us. So that creates a lot of anxiety in a person. They're worried. They're worried all the time, right? So the anxiety certainly is that. Not wanting to feel it creates addictions. Not wanting to feel the addictions or the rage you feel in not having your addictions met creates suppression. Suppression creates depression. So there's a whole heap of layers that create depression. And depression is a facade. It's not allowing the real emotions to come up. The anger and the, other, and the, and the fears to come up. You use depression as a way of detuning from it. So depression is the creation of a facade that is now clinical. <laughs> and then what do we do when it becomes clinical? You go and get some pills for that. So now we're suppressing the depression. <laughs> Now we've got another layer on top of that. It's going to be pretty hard to deconstruct that. You've got to go backwards. You've got to allow yourself to realise depression is the suppression of my rage. I'm angry. Right? And I'm in demand about I want the anger to go away so I suppress it and then, then I feel depressed and then I want the depression to go away so I'm going to get a pill. And so you can't really access the causal emotion, obviously, while... Yeah, on medication. Uh, well, again, it just depends totally on your use of your will. Okay, so that is possible. Certainly, but for most people, they're taking medication to avoid the use of their will. Yeah. So that's going to be difficult. Mm. Right? So I'm not going to give you medical advice, but I'm telling you how what happens. Mm. And what happens is that by the time you've got depressed, you've already suppressed a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah, and you've got to look at reasons why. Oh, I've been depressed, I know what it's like. <laughs> and I was avoiding a lot of things. And I didn't go and get the medication because I thought, yeah, this is just me taking one more step down the road of <laughs> avoiding some things. Okay. How are we doing? You know most of our physical pain? Complete indication of how much facade we're in. Physical pain is created by you. By your avoidance of your emotional, your true emotional condition. When you release your true emotional condition, you won't feel pain in that location of your body. Physical pain is the avoidance of your true emotional condition. Physical pain is created by yourself. But it would be very unfair for God to create a whole heap of physical pains in you that weren't the determination of your own will, would it not? So stop thinking that when you're in pain that it means something else is going wrong other than you avoiding an emotion. Yeah. And I used to have constant pain in my, in my body, my life, emotionally and physically. Constant pain. I used to get like sick every month for five days to seven days every month, all of my life. Right, right from the, my, my mother and father just called me a very sick, sickly child. Suppression of emotion. Once I started letting go of my emotion, my body felt a lot better. Right? The older I get, the better I feel. Because I'm releasing emotion. Right? For most people, there's another suppression, another suppression. The older they get, the worse they feel because they're not releasing anything. Okay, there's plenty of reasons to deconstruct the facade. Your health will improve. We've only listed a few, right? But to me, these are the most important, the bottom two. You can't have a relationship with God with a facade, and God does not want a relationship with you in your facade. God doesn't even want it. Yep. Thanks, Rob. AJ, um, say I've deconstructed part of my facade and then yep. truth and love can enter. Mm -hmm. Can that hurt self have a relationship with God? No. It has to go, the, the hurt has to be exposed and felt, released. 
and yep. then yeah okay yep. thanks god god the hurt self remember is a creation it's yep. not it's not the reality of your soul the hurt mm. self can't have a relationship with god either many of you are trying to have a relationship with god through your hurt self that's why it's not working you know you're in your hurt having a cry and say please help me with this please but it's all you're engaged in a lot of addictive behavior with god as a result of avoiding the feelings of hurt when you truly connect to your feelings of hurt the real self will kick in and that's where you have a relationship with god i thanks yeah remember your real self is your soul this facade self and the hurt selves are creations of your own or others since they are creations of your own or others god did not create them and god doesn't have a relationship with them god only has a relationship with your real self does that make sense to everyone yeah if uh, oh but let's go to Ange and then we'll come down to read read um so in that situation mm -hmm. um you're crying, you're in your damaged self. Yep. Um, like it's, you, you just said that, that God can only have a relationship with our real self. Yep. So is it possible that we can have, you know, an opening to that real self just in that area at that particular time? Of course. And that would be a causal emotion? The feeling of a real emotion of the hurt self yes. is going to release the emotion. Yes. And yeah. during that moment of release, and usually yeah. it's instant, yeah. the moment of release, you will have a connection to your real self. And if your real self at that point in time is longing for God and longing for God's love, you will feel it. Yeah. You're guaranteed. Yeah. Every single time you will feel it. Yeah. And if you think about it, for most of us, we don't feel it every single time, and that's because we're not doing a lot of these things. Yeah. Yeah. In a sense. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Guaranteed. Like, when I say guaranteed, God is the most consistent in thing in the universe being in the universe like god doesn't go uh arbitrary you know like uh yeah i think this time even though Ange is having a real feeling i think this time i'll just not give her love just so that i can punish her or something you know that who does that sound like <laughs> it's certainly not god it sounds more like maybe mum and dad right yeah god's consistent with every single one of god's children god is consistent if you have a sincere desire and you allow the feeling of hurt to flow through you, as it's, even as it's flowing, you will receive some of God's love because now you've got some connection to your real self. And if your real self does have a pure desire for God's love, you will feel it in that moment. You will. It's guaranteed. Yep. Okay, now we were down to reader, I think. <coughs> Uh, you said God sees what and all, and we should see ourselves as God sees us. Yes. Does that mean that God sees all our three selves, and we should yes. learn to see that too? Yes, God sees all. And particularly all, the facade. God sees all of your hurt. God sees all of your facade. All of it. God sees all of it. God does so not have. So he sees all the facade, but he doesn't want a relationship with us as long as we have just the facade. Correct. He doesn't want a relationship with the facade. Because it's actually not real. Because it's not real. Not, uh, not he doesn't real want self. a relationship with the hurt because someone else created it. He wants a relationship with your real self. Your real self is what he created. That's the soul that is you. That is the only part of these three selves, if you like, that is real. That, that is, that is long-term, will remain forever. That's the thing God wants a relationship. Isn't that great? That means that you deal with the facade and you deal with your hurt, your relationship with God's not going to disappear. It's going to get better. If, if God had a relationship with your facade, then what would happen? You'd get rid of your facade and now you'd have no relationship. <laughs> That's not much good. Your facade's temporary. You, you, want to get, you get rid of the facade and all of a sudden your relationship dies. Now, that would have none of us wanting to get rid of our facade, wouldn't it? If, your relationship, if you could maintain a relationship with God through a facade, most of you would prefer to do that, right? Right now? Most of you would prefer to do that. So, so why would there be any reason for giving it up? But to me, this is very important. God doesn't want a relationship with that part of you at all. Isn't that a good reason to give it up? To me, that's the best reason for giving it up. Right. I 
pretty loud, aren't they? <laughs> Should we say that was God's approval? No. <laughs> Gary, thanks. I just might. I just need some clarification on the God's love. Yep. Um, yes. Um, so, so we're hurt and we're damaged, and you know, can we like um, just pray for God's love, like in isolation? Like, can can we just like, you know, say it like, I, I can just long for God's love. Yeah. Have you done that? Yep. Did it work? No. Okay. <laughs> so you have to actually be in the process of. of of releasing the pain you have to have some connection to your real self and when you're mm. in the facade or in your hurt you're not got any real connection to yourself and you've got to feel your way through the facade feel the way through the hurt. Yeah. then you'll get some connection remember yesterday I drew the circle and I said here's your real self here's your here's your three cells if you like your real self at the center all you need is a fissure a, a crack in the facade that allows you to have a crack in the hurt and then you've got some real self poking through and then you can start your relationship. You don't have to have it all done but you're going to have to at least do that one with one thing because if you don't do it with anything you're going to get no results which is what most people have when they hear divine truth. They try, they try, they try, no results for years and the reason why they have no results for years is because they are not allowing the connection with the real self because they are so much in their facade and so much in their hurt, there's no way that anything can get through to their real self. So we've got to allow that to occur. Yep. Most of us don't want to. So that means that we can't have a relationship with God because we don't want to. And God's not going to barrage his way into your real self. <laughs> he, to do that he'd have to break his own laws. Yeah, he'd be sinning against his own laws. That's not going to be possible, is it? He wouldn't make a law and then choose to sin against it. All right. Remember I said every time you impact upon another person's will, you're sinning against God and them. You're breaking one of God's laws. God wouldn't do that with one of God's own laws. So God's not going to force God upon you. You're going to have to do some work to get rid of the things that you and others created. Huh? The bit that God created is that part, the centre part, the real self. That's the bit God created. That's the bit that God wants a relationship with. And by the way, that bit is, is the only bit that's real, so therefore it's not a bit, it's the whole thing. All of these other things, even though I've drawn them as larger, like onion rings, they are nothing. They're all figments, creations of of yours or other people's imagination. They are not your real self. So God can't have a relationship with them. Does everyone get that message? Good, eh? That's good. Okay, well, let's move on, shall we? Okay, now there's a lot more reasons that I feel that there's, uh, most of them are less important than ones that we've already mentioned, so we won't discuss them. How difficult will it be? Well, are you getting a bit of a picture? <sighs> yes. It will be the most difficult thing you've ever had to do, without a doubt. All right. The facade will resist anything other than a sincere and firm desire to attempt its own deconstruction. So I'll just go back and say this, eh? So you can see those two things. Now, while that is a sobering thought, we should all be sober anyway at probably 11 in the morning or 12 now, whatever it is. Um, it's a sobering thought, but it's actually quite a positive thought if you think about it. Because once you have worked through a lot of the deconstruction of your facade, the hard parts done. And the easier parts, which are feeling your hurt, you will find much easier. And this is what everybody who gets onto the divine love path really finds. If you're really on the way to God, the hardest part is the start, making a start. 
this deconstruction of the facade, the hardest part, it's going to be the part of making a start to get to the next level, right? It's going to be the hardest part, but when it's over, you'll start and you, you'll feel it gradually move over. You'll find that it's easier and easier and easier to connect to the hurt and easier to connect to who you really are. Right? And that's a very good thing, if you think about it. It means that once you've done this hardest part, the rest of it is much more easily engaged. Okay. okay. Can you see why the first group had a bit of trouble with this discussion? Now, facing the facade self, this is material that I first shared with people nine years ago. It's actually on the website. Who's found it on the website? A few of you, yeah. It's amazing what we skip over, isn't it? Most have neither read the material nor applied it because most of us are in complete denial about the facade or have no risk to break it down. So what is the process of deconstructing the facade? And like I've said out there, what is the process of deconstructing anything in your soul? Because it, it applies, this process applies in all cases. Right? Now before we move on, you want to have questions? Well, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to go through this after a break. What is the process? So would you like to ask some questions before we start on that? Or would you want to get started after a break onto that straight away? Okay, so let's have a break for five or ten minutes so you can go to the toilet and stuff and we'll get started on that. <laughs> 